you have a Bible, I'd like to read in the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. Luke's Gospel chapter 15. This is a very interesting chapter. Um, takes us right to the words of the Lord Jesus. And I think you'll appreciate that when the Lord Jesus spoke, he, he didn't have to go to UBC or any of the higher colleges around here to understand what he was saying. He, he spoke very simply, very simply. But what he said was profound. What he said was far-reaching. And what he said was designed to go to the very core of our being. So I want to read in Luke chapter 15, and we'll begin at verse number 1 because we have a reaction of some of the individuals that were listening. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now that was one group. Those are people that appreciated grace, and they needed grace, and they knew that, and they drew near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured. Now that's the other group. They didn't need grace. They were good in themselves, and they were looking down on these other people. Then drew near unto, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Can you believe that? He identifies with, with sinners, and he eats with them. And he, that is the Lord Jesus, spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them? does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver... If she lose one piece, does not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. He began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the pigs, to feed swine, and he, he would fain, he would desire to have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man, no one gave unto him. And when he had come to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. That's all I deserve. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Great ending, isn't it? Luke chapter 15 that we have read is, is, is a really, it's a very, very wonderful chapter because there are some very important truths that these three stories bring into focus. Number one, they bring into focus the tremendous reality of our lostness. Did you notice the Lord Jesus spoke about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son? So I want to just focus very quickly, and I trust very directly, the reality of the lostness of each one of us. We too are lost, and I, I think we all love to sing Amazing Grace, but have, have you ever discovered that you are lost? Oh, you say, I don't think so. I'm, I'm doing fine. 
Well, the, the old hymn says, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And if you were to ask me, did I ever discover I was lost? I, I'd say, sit down, let's have a copy. I'll tell you all about it. Because 47 years ago, 47 years ago last month, March the 6th, I came to discover firsthand that I was lost. And that was the moment, March the 6th, when I was found, when I was saved. I was blind, but now I see. The reality of our lostness, the rejoicing of finding is, is, is right through this entire chapter. The rejoicing of finding. And here's a shepherd, he comes home and he said, wow, that was a big journey, that was a lot of work, so I'm, I'm going to bed. No, not, not this shepherd. No. He got on the phone, he says, look, come on over. A great thing happened. I found the sheep that was lost. Please come over and we'll rejoice together. The woman did the same thing. She'd lost a, one of her ten coins. And she called up her friends and says, come on over. Because I'm so thrilled to have found that piece. It's so valuable to me. And then, of course, this, this wonderful story of a father. And the father, he says, my, this is, this is a great day. He said, bring the fatted calf. You make a big festival. You make a big banquet. This, my son, has come home. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. You see, tonight, this is, this is a reminder of the reality of, of, of how heaven sees the great work of salvation and the great transaction when a person is found and rescued and delivered and saved. It thrills heaven. And if you were to discover the reality of God's salvation, you would be thrilled tonight. You'd leave rejoicing. Now, I'm not going to tell you how I was saved tonight, but I'll just tell you this, that when I understood that the Lord Jesus had died for me at the cross, I was lying in my bed in a boarding house, and I don't know what hour of the night it was. I had gone to bed, but I couldn't sleep. And I just read Isaiah 53 and 6, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. That means I was lost. And I said, that's exactly true. God is telling the truth about me. And the Lord laid on him, on the sin bearer, on Christ, the sin of us all. And for the first time in my life, of almost 22 years, I came to understand that what took place at the cross was for me. And I, well, I felt, I felt like shouting. I was in a boarding house with other university students. I remember putting up my hand like this and says, thank God I'll never be in hell. Never. Thrilled. Thrilled. The rejoicing of finding, but there's one more thing. There's the reckoning of our worth. The reckoning of our worth. I still remember, uh, it was 23 years ago, we were having a, a gospel tent series. We had services like this in a, in a gospel tent in just outside of Hartford, Connecticut, staying with a, a very wonderful couple, relations of our brother Peter. And um, I just remember coming down and um, they had just got the new Time magazine. And so I took a quick look at it and on the front cover was a picture of a, of a young Air Force pilot. And across that, that cover of Time magazine in 1995, the month of June, it has some simple words. All for one. All for one. And if any of you remember the story of Scott O'Greedy, you'll remember that, that tremendous search and rescue mission that found him. And tonight, that's what the gospel's all about. You see, we have read about a, a shepherd with a hundred sheep, and he lost one of them. One of them wandered away. And he could have said, hey, I, I've got 99, so I'm not, I'm not going to worry about one percent. Forget it. it. It's his fault. It's, it's the sheep's fault. I, I'm not going to bother. But that sheep had tremendous value to that shepherd. And he went after that sheep until he found it. One out of a hundred. And then the Lord Jesus tells about a story about a woman with ten coins. Now, now we're narrowing the number, aren't we? Not just one percent, but now she discovers she's, there's one, one piece that's missing. 
And we read about this woman and she, she be, takes the broom and she begins to sweep, clearing out the, the, the darkness and clearing away the, the debris until she found it. And she rejoiced, one out of ten. And then we have read about two sons. You can read all about it. We, we took the time to read part of this parable. Two sons. And one of them went his own way. One of them said, Dad, I'm out of here. Give me what's coming to me. And the father graciously gave it to him. And then we read about a son coming back. One out of two. And it just makes me aware that God places eternal, infinite value on every single one of us. I've heard preachers say that sinners are of no value to God. I don't believe that. We are profitless. We are profitless. We have missed the mark. But in God's sight, every individual has tremendous value. And tonight, this, this amazing chapter tells us about the, the value of just one soul. I don't know if you've ever appreciated that. I don't know if you've ever, ever thought about how God sees you. You see, you are not a mistake. You're not a no-namer with God. You're not insignificant. God's eye is upon every individual. And the Bible makes it so clear that God desires that every single person, every single person would come to the truth. That every single person would be saved. And what God has done in giving his son and the work of the cross is sufficient. I don't like that. Is sufficient to meet the need of every single individual on planet earth. There, is no, there are no exceptions. But of course, God will respect your, your choice, your will. And so tonight we want to look at these three, these three simple and yet very important truths. The reality of our lostness. You know, when we speak about being lost, um, people kind of uh, revolt a little bit. Because it would be easy to look around and say, well, that's not me. That would obviously refer to somebody else. But the Bible makes it very clear that as God sees us, he sees us simply as lost, lost. In fact, the Lord Jesus himself said, the Son of Man, that would be himself, the Son of Man is come, and here's the reason, to seek and to save that which is lost. And so tonight we've been looking at the Lord Jesus in very aspects. Let me just tell you that I want to look at the at the seeking shepherd or the seeking savior. He is seeking for you. He is. And he's seeking for us because we are lost. The Bible says if our gospel is hid, it is hid to them that are lost. And you might say, well, I don't understand. That certainly does not apply to me. Well, these three stories bring before us three different aspects of being lost. You see, the story of a of a sheep that wanders away. Now, let's face it, sheep are not the most intelligent of the animals. I, I don't mean to put any type of animals down, but uh, sheep are not the, the, the smartest animals, are they? They have no honing instinct. They don't have any GPS built in. They just, they just wander, face down, munching the grass, going here, going there. And, and you can just see this, this little animal just moving away unaware, unaware of how far he's gone. And it's just a little reminder that as the Lord Jesus speaks about each of us being lost, we're just like sheep. I've already quoted the verse that God used to speak to me, all we, just like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the sad thing is, is that they're individuals, and maybe, maybe it applies to you tonight that you are unaware, you are unaware of how lost you really are. You're not aware of, of the results of your sin. You see, sin has, sin has marred every one of us and marked every one of us. Every one of us have come short of the glory of God's standard. We have all moved on, on our own, own course. And we are unaware of how damaging and how serious our sin really is. And it's only when a person is made aware of that, 
that they will, they will desire to, to be rescued and to be delivered and to be saved. I well remember my father has gone home to heaven, but I re well remember um, he, he was having just a very, it was day surgery. And uh, I hadn't gotten the results, and so I called my sister-in-law, and she, I said, how's dad? He said, well, you haven't heard the report? I said, no. Well, they said they discovered cancer. Now, they're just going to go and remove a couple of little polyps. But when I heard the big C word, I thought, ooh. Now, my father could have said, oh, that's nothing. I mean, I'm not going to worry about just a few little polyps. But you see, you, you, you dare not minimize a physical need, a physical condition. And as God looks at every one of our lives, we have all been tainted and we have all been marked with the reality of the cancer of sin. People are unaware of the seriousness of sin. People are unaware of where their sin is taking them. You see, the Bible tells us, and the Lord Jesus spoke about two roads tonight. Just two roads. Not religious roads. No, two roads. There's a wide road. There's a narrow road. Matthew chapter 7. And the wide road leads, the Bible says, down to destruction. And the narrow road leads to eternal life. And tonight, every individual in this audience is on one of those two roads. And it was only when I, when I became aware that I was on the broad road and that I was in danger of losing my soul in hell. You say, do you people believe in hell? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's in the Bible. The Lord Jesus spoke clearly about hell. And that's why when I began to face the tremendous reality, if I were to lose my soul, I would be in the darkness of hell forever. I became alarmed. I was unaware. I thought everything was fine. I was a church member. I, I, was, I was trying to live a moral life. I was trying to do the best I could. I sang in the choir. I was unaware. I was lost, ignorantly lost, with regard to my real condition. You see, the Lord Jesus told about this, this woman with the, with the coins. And those coins had, had some purpose, didn't they? They were of value to her. There was currency involved. They had a purpose. And tonight, God has, has made you with a purpose. And, and I don't know what makes life tick for you. I don't know what's going to propel you out of bed tomorrow morning and say, let's get at it. Uh, there, there are some men, they, they live for money, live for business, live for pleasure, live for the weekends, live for relationships. Now, I know we all have to have money, we all need a job and so on, but, but God made us for a higher purpose than that. God made us for himself. God made us that we might know him and that we might enjoy him, and that we might love him, and that we might understand and appreciate that there is a, a, a divine purpose for our lives, not to live for ourselves, but for him. In fact, there was a man by the name of Saul, and he hated Christ, and one day his life was transformed. Read about it in Acts chapter 9, a thrilling, dramatic chapter. And a few years later, he took up his pen, he wrote these words, to me to live, Christ, Christ, and to die is gain, more of Christ. I wonder, have you discovered the purpose for which God has made you? Because if you're not, if you haven't, then, my dear friend, you're, you're, you're lost. You're missing out on the purpose for which God has made you. And of course, the, the son, we call him the prodigal son, he moved away from the family from the enjoyment of a relationship, from participation in that family. He didn't appreciate the Father. Didn't appreciate the blessings. And uh, I thought I could do it myself. I thought I was doing fine. But there came a moment when I understood, I need God. I need a Savior. And that moment of moments on that boarding house bed, I came to understand that by faith I was brought into the very family of God. And now God is my Father. That's wonderful. The Lord Jesus is my Savior. I'm going to be with Him and like Him forever. Not because of what I've done or because of who I am. It's because of His grace. And tonight, as we have looked at very briefly at these three parables, 
we get a little idea as to how lost, lost we really are. I wonder, have you ever, in the honesty of your heart, faced what God's verdict is? Oh God, I am lost, lost. That's humbling, but so vital. But I want to tell you something else about this wonderful chapter, that there is a savior, a shepherd, that is seeking for you. That's what this chapter is all about, about the joy of finding, but it involves a search. And, and here's a shepherd, just to go to the first little, little story that the Lord Jesus told, and he makes a discovery that there's one sheep missing. And instead of just glossing over that, he says, I've got to find that sheep, and he heads out into the, into the wilderness, and he begins to look for that sheep, until he found it. Now how far he went, we're not told. How difficult that journey was, we're not told. What it involved, we're not told. But he searched for that lost sheep until he found it. And as I was just reading a little bit about Scott O'Grady, I, I couldn't help but be impressed that that uh, pilot who was flying um, peacekeeping missions over Bosnia back in 1995, uh, was shot down, his F-16 fighter pilot was, was hit, and he ejected, pulled that golden handle, and he ejected out and began to parachute down into enemy territory. The plane was literally split in two. He watched it go down in flames and crash, and he knew as he descended, I don't know how far up he was, but as he descended, he knew that he hardly had a chance of survival. He landed, ditched his parachute, and ran as far and as fast as he could because he, he was well aware that the enemy was around. And finally, he dove down into the, into the leaves, face down, kicked some leaves up around him, and hoped that he wouldn't be discovered. If you read the story, it's, it's very dramatic because Within just a, just a matter of minutes, they're, they're, the, the enemy was around and they were, they were trying to put their, their bayonets down and they fired some shots trying to, uh, trying to arouse him. But he'd been taught well and he just lay there. And finally they moved off. And for six days, six long nights, Scott O'Grady survived on beetles and lizards and caught a little bit of rainwater in a plastic bag. And finally, on the sixth night, he got his little transistor radio out, his little messenger, and he wired a, a message to the planes going over. He, he, had, he had made some tweets before, or some beeps rather, not tweets, some beeps, and uh, it was before that time. And uh, they recognized that somebody was doing it. But on the sixth night, they recognized, he said, Basher, Basher, this is Scott O'Grady. And that message was received just after midnight. And by 4.40 in the morning, the U.S., along with some other allies, had amassed a contingent of planes and helicopters and, and, and Marines to try and descend into enemy territory for just one, one man, one man. I, I, I was thrilled because it, it took almost 40 planes. Now, they weren't all active, but they were all in standby. There were 16 seven-blade helicopters. And as those two sea stallion choppers came down and Scott O'Grady was aware that the rescue was coming, and so he actually set off a flare and there was yellow smoke coming up. And one of those sea stallion helicopters pitched and, and, and the back ramp opened up and 20 Marines took their position. And then the second sea chopper uh, landed, pitched. And they saw a young man with a, with a gun, revolver, racing, racing for the door. And before the other 20 Marines were able to get out of that helicopter, they pulled Scott O'Grady in. The other 20 that were already out went back into their chopper. They did a quick head count. And within seven minutes, they were airborne again. And by 7.30 in the morning, he was back on the aircraft carrier. All for one. 
Do you know how much heaven paid for you? Do you know how far the Savior went for you? Sometimes we, we sing down from the glory the Savior came. Down to the cross. And the death of shame. It's a long journey. It was a costly journey. Because you see, when he came, he came knowing, knowing that it would involve his death at the cross. He knew that. It was not a mistake. It wasn't a plan that had gone off the rails. In fact, he'd come to lay down his life. He'd come to lay down his life for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And there upon a cross, the greatest search and rescue mission ever was, was unfolded and, and accomplished when he died for our sins. When he accomplished the greatest of all works, he himself could say, it's finished, it's paid in full. And tonight, you could be rescued. You could be saved. You could move from being lost to enjoying the, the wonder of, of his salvation. Uh, my, my, my time is gone. Let me just ask you one question. Are you saved tonight? The Bible says we, we must be saved. We must be rescued. You say, oh, I, I don't... No, I'm, I'm not saved. Well, then, my dear friend, tonight, you, you could be saved. Because that's why Christ, Christ came into this world, to save sinners, to find them, to deliver them, to rescue them, and to give them everlasting life. I'm glad he found me. I really am. And eternally, I will never, never, never stop thanking him that he ever saw me and went all the way to Calvary to pay for my sins. I trust tonight, if you've never received Christ, that this will be your night when you will trust him and receive him as your Savior.